All right, so we're supposed to get started now. Um, before we start, uh, obviously there's been another schedule change. So Justin's going to take my session at uh, 3 o'clock this afternoon. And I've also been told that after the session, she shouldn't forget to vote. So uh, yeah, please do that. <laughs> So welcome to my talk, and today we're going to talk about framework design. But before we get started, I'm going to need your help for a bit. I'm going to be a bit annoying today. So I'm going to need everybody just to stand up. <laughs> yes, you're going to have to work for a bit. <laughs> now, if your birthday is on an even date, I need you to stand like this. Everybody that has a birth, nobody has a birthday at a, in an even date? No, just stand with your hands like this. Now, obviously, everybody else has a birthday that's on an odd date, right? So you stand with your hands like this. Okay? Let me just take a couple of pictures. <laughs> so some of you might actually figure it out. You can sit down now. So even if I bomb today, you, you just, I got picture proof that you gave me a standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> you got to prepare. The demagogues may not be agreeing with me today. <laughs> All right. So uh, my name is Andreas Helkansson, but my, most people might know me off Twitter as the Code Junkie. And I like to write open source software. I have a huge, you can call it almost an obsession. And I like to write frameworks as well. And if I can combine the two, I'm very happy. Uh, one of the frameworks that I've helped create is called Nancy. It's an open source web framework for .NET and Mono. Uh, we've worked on it for about four years. It's MIT licensed. It's also one of the top five C-sharp projects on GitHub. And in case you have not already figured it out, I also get to, to uh, make a living somehow. I can just be the open source hippie that sits at home at night and writes source code. So I have the great fortune to work at Treton Tratiqua as well. So, a quick show of hands. How many here have ever built a framework or is building a framework right now? It's a lot of people, cool. And out of those people that just raised your hand, how many of you consider yourself framework designers versus just building a framework? So one, just John? <laughs> well, you're in the right talk then. <laughs> so the reason that I make this distinction between building versus designing a framework is because I think that there's a huge difference between writing source code that, that you have the intent of just using for yourself and writing source code that's intended for someone else to use. So for that reason, I like to think of uh, framework building as having two parts. The first part is all about building the features and all the functionality that we want to put in our framework. This is also what I consider to be the easy part, and it's also what most developers find their most comfortable with. And the reason for this is quite, quite obvious if you think about it, because the, the intent, the purpose of any framework is to either simplify or to eliminate problems that we face in our day-to-day -day jobs, right? We want to make things easier, so we package them up in a nice framework that we can, can reuse over time. And if there's one thing I do know about developers uh, from working for 15 years as a developer is that when we as a developer, we're faced with a problem or a challenge, something happens to us. Our brain like immediately goes like, challenge accepted! And we go into what I call like superhero mode. And we start seeing all these solutions to the problem that we need to solve. We start thinking about what algorithms can we apply, what design patterns should we be using. And it's like we, we, we're almost like in the movie Matrix. You can see the code just scroll by our eyes that we need to write, and it's all about typing it down fast enough before we lose the, lose the mojo to do it. And the, so the second part to framework building is once we have all these features, once we have, have all the functionality that, that we want to do, is that we need to take all of these things and package them up in a nice and easy to use API, right? And if we take a moment just to think about when we're building traditional applications where we're targeting web or the mobile or the desktop, we often talk about the need or the use to or desire to wanting to create a good user experience. And what we mean by that is that not only do we want to create a uh, user interface that's beautiful and visually appealing, but we also want to create a user interface that communicates the uh, capabilities and intents of that user interface in a clear and a concise manner to users. So it's obvious what kind of interactions are available and how those interactions are meant to be performed. 
Now, when we're building framework, we're not doing anything different because the, the API that we package all these features and functionality into, that is the user interface of our framework, right? That is the part of our framework that users are going to interact with. So we want, we want to think about the same kind of, of things as when we're building gr like graphical user interface. We want to think about what are we communicating, what intents are we uh, conveying. And if we don't think about this from a very early stage, or if we completely just ignore it at all, then we might end up building something like this. And imagine that you're the guy that comes along and someone says, y you're going to use this. <laughs> and you go, hmm, interesting. So <laughs> what does it do? I mean, I it's not quite obvious. What, what can I do with this gizmo, I think? Uh, where do I start? I mean, uh, am I supposed to press one of the switches over there? Uh, which one am I supposed to press? And it could be the self-destruct button. Who knows? And we want to try to avoid this. So we have to think about this from a, from a very early stage, and we can't just completely ignore it. And truth is also, as, as developers, we have a tendency to want to follow the path of least resistance. So what this means is, from a, from a framework perspective, is that the framework that solves the problem we want to solve and does it with the least amount of friction and frustration is also the thing that that's going to rise to the top, right? It's the thing that most developers are going to end up using. And we should, when we're building our frameworks, that should be the aspiration that we have. We want to be a part of the top tier because if we're down at the bottom, people wo they won't use the stuff that we're that we're writing and that that we think are good and we want people to use. So we just can't ignore this. It, we have to apply it from a very early stage. So I mentioned in the introduction that. For approximately four years now, we have been working on ASCII, and from a very early stage, we established something that we call the super duper happy path. And basically, what that is is a set of four criteria that, and I'm not going to recite each one of them, but you can think about the super duper happy path kind of like the prime directive in Star Trek. So, if a new feature that we're about to add to the framework does not fill all these four criteria, then we're not going to put it in. And one of the criteri criteria more or less says that the code that we write should be easy to use. We want to provide a good user experience. And for this reason, that whenever we start about thinking about adding a new feature to our framework, we almost always start to, to think about the feature from an API, API point of view. Because we kind of figure that the actual implementation is not going to be that hard, right? But packaging the, the functionality of that feature in a good API, that's where we've learned that the challenges are. We, like, we have to do a lot of creative thinking to get this good API. And when I say an easy to use API, I don't, I don't say it's a easy does not mean stupid, right? Because there you, because you make a simple API, it doesn't mean you have to trade off functionality. You can still have a very functional API that's easy to use. All you have to do is apply a bit of creative thinking. So what we're seeing at the screen today is, is actually a piece of uh, uh, software that's using NASI to create a very simple application. And even if you're not, if you never used NASI before, you, I mean, you don't have to worry because this is what we call a route handler. And you can think of a route handler kind of like a controller action in ASP.MVC. So whenever an, an HTTP GET request is sent in, and it happens to match the, the parameter defined within the square brackets, then we're going to execute this function. And whatever return value the function has, we're going to return it back to the caller, right? And the code here might look very simple, but that's because we've put a lot of effort into creating this simple to use API. So that there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes. So today we're going to mainly be focusing on this snippet of code for the remainder of the session. And we're going to break a couple of these things down and see what we're doing behind the scenes to enable something like this. So the first thing we're going to look at is dynamics. And dynamics is not new. I think it was introduced early 2010, so it's well over three years old now. But it's something that we're not still not used to see in everyday work. We, not, we don't see a lot in frameworks. We don't, definitely don't see a lot in applications. And it's almost like a lot of developers are not comfortable stepping out of the statically typed world and into the dynamic world. But we found that it adds a lot to the way we're building APIs, and we kind of use it 
in several places. So if you look at the highlighted sections of this code snippet now, you see that when we actually invoke our function, our route handler is invoked, then we're going to pass in a variable called parameters into our function. And on that variable, we're going to uh, access a property called name. And nothing is out of the ordinary here. This is standard C-sharp code, right? If it wasn't for the fact that the type that parameter is, it doesn't have a property called name, it doesn't exist. So normally what would happen here is that the compiler, he would step in and say, whoa, 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 hold on here. I know for a fact that the type that parameters is, it doesn't have a name property. So I'm not even going to build this code because I know if I let you build this code and execute the code, we're going to have an issue when you hit that line of code, right? So fix your issues and come back and we'll talk again. But what's happening here is that the type that parameter is, is, is a dynamic type. So when we tell the compiler that parameter is dynamic, we kind of tell the compiler, fine, we'll assume the responsibility of making sure that this code executes and it doesn't break our execution at runtime. So what happens here is when the, when the get request is sent in, whatever value is sent on the route, we capture as a, as a parameter called name because we use the name of the parameter as the key. We take the key and the value, and we stick it inside as a dynamic class or, or object. And at runtime, when we try to query the property, the, the dynamic class will actually say, I see you're trying to access a property called name. I don't have a property called name, but it just so happens that I have a piece of information, the information that we captured before, stored internally with the key of name. So I'm just going to make the assumption that what you really wanted is the piece of information that's stored with that key of name. So I'm going to return it to you. So for what this means from an API point of view is that our users, they don't have to write static type classes for the parameters they send in. They can just add parameters in their string and they'll automatically be available at runtime. So that's less code for our users to write. It also means that you don't have to use dictionary accesses to access uh, the, the values. So you get to write code that's a lot more expressive, right? And the third thing that's going on behind the scenes here is if you were using a dictionary instead, chances are that that dictionary probably would be of type object. So when we're doing our string comparison here, we would actually have to do a type casting before doing the comparison. But our implementation of that dynamic object is clever enough to know that you're asking for a string, so we're actually going to give you a string back. And this is something that we use in a, ver in a different couple of places in, in NAS. We use dynamics pretty extensively. And another example is the use of query string parameters, because that's also key value based data. So if, as soon as you hit query dot, and whatever you type after is going to be the name of that query string parameter, and we're going to give you the value back, assuming that it's sent in. And we do the same for form data, which is also name value uh, based data. And creating something like this is very easy. It doesn't take a lot of effort to implement at all, but it actually helps simplify the API. It reduces the amount of code that needs to be written, and, it, and the code that we do write is a lot more expressive. So we're going to look at a quick demo for Dynamics. Now, the really cool thing about Dynamics is obviously not being able to create dynamic dictionaries uh, like this is, but when the actual dynamic operation takes place, we get to decide what kind of code we want to add, we want to execute. So we can actually add behaviors to these dynamic calls. So in this simple demo, what I've created here is just a class called capitalizer. We tell the compiler that we want it to be treated in a dynamic fashion. We assign two properties, name and description, and then we just write them back out to the console. But if we look at the actual implementation of the, the class, there's a couple of things to notice here. First is that we inherit from dynamic object. And this is like, this is a helper class in the .NET framework that provides a very nice abstraction to handle these kind of dynamic invocations on your objects. What we're doing here is that we are overriding two methods, the try get member and try set member. And these are going to get called when we try to read or write from a property. And using the binder that's sent in, we can actually figure out the name of the property. And in this case, we're just going to use it as the key in a, in a dictionary. So when, when someone actually sets a member, we just store it in the dictionary as, as a string. But then when we read it back out again, we've added a behavior. We've, we've added a behavior that says, 
whenever you read a value out, you're going to get the uppercase representation of that string. So we added a behavior to our property. We're just not sending data back and forth. We can actually decide at runtime what we want to do. We can implement whatever logic we want. And if we run this code, no. <laughs> so it's a good thing I took the pictures up front. Yeah, so we see we get the uppercase representation back, even though we added, we uh, assigned it lowercase representations on it. So I really encourage all of you to explore dynamics a bit more because it, it doesn't have to be full scale dynamics. You can isolate different places in your source code where you can take use of this dynamic functionality, and, uh, and it's really powerful, and there's, there's not a lot to it. So don't be afraid to mix and match statically and dynamic, dynamically typed worlds. The next thing we're going to look at is, is the use of the implicit cast operators. And, and we use, uh, again, we, this is something that we use, actually we use it fairly moderate, but uh, at target locations. So if you look at the code again, I've highlighted three lines of code. And all of these are return statements. The first line is going to return a, an instance of a JSON response object. The second line is actually returning an enum value, while the third one is returning an action of stream. But we could have just as well return just a plain string or an integer. And again, nothing out of the ordinary. If the expected return value of a function was object, which is obviously not, because then I wouldn't be standing here talking about it, right? So the expected return value for this function is a type of response. So you, how can we return an integer when we're actually returning, expecting someone to return a, a response, right? So the thing that we do is we've implemented implicit casting support on our response class. So we went through and we looked at what are the different kind of things that people are most likely want to return from their route handlers. And we, we stepped in and we added uh, support for casting between these two, uh, these types to our response in our response class. So if we didn't add this, the compiler again, he would step in. He's very nosy, right? And say, no, this is not going to work because Again, I, I'm expecting a response object, but you're giving me an integer. I have no idea how to go between the two, right? You fix it and you come back. It's kind of nice even though it's nosy. So we went in and added these implicit cast operators on our response class. So what de de they actually do is we it enabled us to tell the compiler that, okay, so you're, you're, you're getting an integer back, but you're expecting a response just so happens that I know how I can take that integer and I can create a response for you. So you just give me the integer and I'll give you the response back and everybody will be happy and our code will compile. But on top of that, we also added a set of conventions to our implicit cast operators. We, we looked at the different types that we're returning and we said, okay, if you're returning a string, then it's likely that you want to return a response object with the content set to the value of that string. And Likewise, if you're returning the integer, you're probably going to return a response object with the status code set to that value. And again, this helps our users. Not only does it reduce the amount of code that they have to write, because normally what we would be expecting here is that someone will be returning a new HTTP status code response or a new content response. And we've seen this in popular frameworks, right? Um, Beca and we can remove the need for users to create uh, instances of those and return that. But that also means that there's less code for us to maintain because we don't have to ship these classes out of the box. So there's no less code for us to maintain, less code to screw up. And last of all, we also think is it re uh, increases the readability of the code. It actually uh, increases the, uh, the intent of the code when you read it. It's quite clear what you're returning. So let's look how uh, have a quick look at a demo. Mm -hmm. 
So in, in this demo, we have a very simple framework that has just two methods on it, return content result and return status code result, right? And the uh, current implementation is just creating a new instance of the results object, and it's assigning the appropriate value to the appropriate property before returning it. But we, what we want to eliminate this complexity. We don't want to force our users to have to create our just the, the result object when they want to return something as obvious as the content or a status code. So this is what we actually want want our users to be able to write. But as we can see, here's the Nozzy compiler again. He's saying, I, I have no uh, idea how to go from a string to a result object, and I have no idea how to go from an integer to that result object. So we, if we drop down to our result object and we actually implement the implicit cast operators for this, you can now see that our code, the compiler is not complaining anymore. And if we check out the actual implementations, we can see that when we get a status code instead of a result object, we are internally we create a new instance of the result object, and we assign the value of that integer to the status code, and then we return the configure instance, and, and likewise for the, for the string-based one, but we set the content. So now if we run this code, hopefully it won't break this time. <laughs> oh, I know what it is. It's my git ignore file. <laughs> so this is going to happen for every demo. Well, I'll just check real quick. Right, so now if we run this demo, you can see that we get two response objects back, uh, sorry, two result objects back with the status code or the content set, when all we are doing is returning an integer or a string. And there is actually a just an overflow of the two string that writes out the state uh, the state of the current result object. Mm. Yeah, if you tell me how. <laughs> Work out. Uh. So I do it on the running instance. It's going to persist between. font size is this no there is no font size oh this is yeah so this is probably as big as it gets clear so the next thing is what we call marker interfaces and if we look at the code again, I've just highlighted a single line of code. And I've already told you that this is going to return an instance of a JSON response, right? And we actually have a couple of these helper response classes pre-built into Nancy to just make your life a little bit easier. So we have like the JSON response one, we have an XML one, we have one for returning images, another one for returning files. And as we were starting to implement more and more of these, we also started thinking along the lines of, how can we make it obvious to the users of our framework that these helpers are available without forcing people to read our source code or force our, us to spend our valuable time on writing documentation that nobody will end up reading anyway? So how can we surface these classes and make it more obvious for users uh, when they start exploring Nancy? And the solution to this that we came up with is what we call the, the marker interfaces. And a marker interface is nothing but an empty Im interface with a name that just makes sense within uh, the context that is going to be used. But what that interface lets us do is attach um, extension methods to it, right? So in this, for this instance, ask JSON is, is an extension method on a specific marker interface. And so as soon as our users go in and they hit response dot, the IntelliSense window is going to show all these extension methods. And it's going to be very obvious that, you, uh, that there is an extension method called AskJSON. And the AskJSON extension method has the responsibility of creating the JSON response up before you. And you can see all the different respons response types that we ship out of the box. So it kind of solves our discoverability problem. But it turns out it doesn't only just solve our discoverability problem, but it also s uh, solves the problem for third-party developers. So if anyone in the audience were to use NASI and create a couple of different helper classes, response classes, and you think, well, these are pretty handy if someone else could use them as well. I find them useful, so I want to package them up and I want to put them on a new git, right? 
So when I come along and I say, well, this NuGet sounds useful, it has this special response object I want to use, it saves me from writing it and from having to sort out bugs in it. So I pull it into my project, and if you, as the author of that NuGet or the source code, also provide the equivalent um, ex uh, extension methods for these response types, then as soon as I install your NuGet and I go back to my code and I hit response dot, your extension methods are also going to be made available, right? So I immediately know what kind of functionality was added to my, or capabilities was added to my applications just by installing a NuGet. And so we've solved our discoverability problems and we've helped third-party developers surface their material as well in a very easy way to our users. But again, I keep falling back to this and this also has like a side effect and, it, and this, uh, the nice side effect is that it also increases the readability of our code once again. Because we figured out that if we take the marker interface that has a, a name that makes sense within the context of developing these extensions and we stick behind a property with a name that makes sense within the context that it's going to be used. So for instance, in this, uh, in this case, the, the marker interface is hitting behind the property of type, uh, sorry, a property called response of the type of our marker interface. It doesn't necessarily have to return anything. It can just return null if you actually try to use the return value. So if you read the code, but just by following the simple naming convention as well on our, on our extension methods, the code actually reads out a return a response as JSON. So the intent of the code is very obvious. If you read that, there's no mistake in what the code is going to do. So we get three nice benefits from basically just an empty interface. And because this is just a simple empty interface, the actual implementation is very easy. So we have this abstract class that's an endpoint that, with that the user of a framework are intended to, uh, to create implementations for uh, that has a method that returns whatever response you want to return back. And we create a very simple implementation and we can see we're returning that instance of the JSON response. But again, what we want to enable our users to do is, is not only create the more expressive code, but uh, also have a nice way to figure out what kind of extension methods are available or what response types is. So if we add the marker interface, as you can see, it's just an empty interface, you, and you should probably should give it a better name in your project. And we hide that behind a property that, with ha that has a context-specific um, name that makes sense within the context. So now we can go back and we can add the, the extension method on that interface, and that in, in the extension method creates the instance of that JSON response, and it passes back. And now we can see that this code actually compiles and again, if, we, if we're in a state that we just written response, we'd see that as, as JSON is, is available. So it's a very easy, I mean, we could do write this as a single line of code if we wanted to, and this is one line of code. So two lines of code, and you actually increase the discoverability of features in your framework or in your project. And this obviously could be applied outside of framework context as well. So it's very high gain from very from a very minimal effort. Now most frameworks today, they have one or more ways for you to customize or extend the functionality. So if, you, if it, it doesn't really quite work the way you want, you can figure out an interface and you can create the implementation, right? And so I like to think as the traditional implement, the extensibility point model of a framework usually consists of the two steps. First, you need to figure out what do I want to extend, and you need to figure out which, like, which interface you or abstract base class or base class you need to inherit from, and you create your own implementation. And once you created your implementation, you have to go back once again. You need to tell that framework about the new functionality that you've created. So, whether that means that you're adding into some sort of collection on, uh, add the type to a collection on the, on the framework itself, or maybe drop down to a configuration file and figure out which section is the, or do I add this information to. And then you can use the framework and then it will know about the new, the new functionality, right? So when we start thinking about our extensibility points, when we start to design our extensibility points, we start to think more and more about the second step. I mean, 
is it really necessary? Is there is, can we make it simpler? I mean, we don't like the use of configuration file, and we don't want to force our people, uh, our users, to explicitly go and tell the framework about stuff that it probably shouldn't know about. So the solution that we came up with was, let's just remove it. Let's just eliminate that step entirely, and let the, let's not force our users to explicitly tell us. So what instead we we do is. NASI figures out that the extension is available. So at runtime, NASI will actually go out and look for implementations of these ex known extensibility types that we have in our framework, and it will find them, it will create a new instance of them, and it will wire them up at the right place in the framework. So when you sit down and you just create your implementation, you can just hit F5, and your, your new functionality will be immediately available. There's no additional steps required. And this kind of gives it a magical sense because you write your implementation, you hit F5, and it just works. You, yeah, good for me. <laughs> and the basis for all of this is the 10 or 12 lines of code that's on the screen right now. So what, what this code will do is it will iterate through all the public types in all the assemblies in your entire app domain. And for those types, it's going to compare them against a known extensibility type in our framework. If one of these types implements them, then we're going to return that type back. That then we can take those types and we can create the instances and we can wire them up at a different location, right? And it's what ten, like I said, ten or twelve lines of code, and it really just eliminates the amount of code that that people have to write to use your framework. We have a big passion about about rem reducing the amount of framework code that people have to write. We think the important code that you as a user should be writing is application code. There should be a l a not a lot of ceremony to use the framework. You don't get paid to write framework code, right? You get paid to write application code. So that's where you should spend most of your time. And this kind of stems from our philosophy of when we're designing an API for something, if we can take a lot of the complexity of that feature or using that feature and hide it behind these easy APIs, opposed to just creating the quickest implementation of the interface, uh, the API that we can think of, and letting our users write this complicated usage code each and every time, then we're going to use, we're always going to go with the former. Because that means that when we write the code, we get to write it once, package it up in our framework, and ship it. But the alternative would be if we create, took the easy path for us, that our users would have to create, write this complicated code every time. And that would just build up frustration with using the framework. And, and eventually, it's going to leave a bitter taste, and you're going to start looking for options, right? So we just want to eliminate this kind of ceremony that's going on. So look at a quick demo of this. So what we have here is a very basic framework. Uh, it basically takes a culture string, and it's going to look for some of them that can take this culture and provide you an, an ingredient in that culture. So the actual framework, what it will do is, at startup, it will apply assembly scanning, and it will look for implementations of our known extensibility type, which in this case is the iGreeter. And for all the types that the assembly scanner, or sorry, the app domain scanner sends back, we're going to create an instance, and we're going to stick it in an internal list. So when the user hits five, we go out, we find the implementations that you have provided, we create the instance for you, and we wire them up. And in this case, the wiring them up is just adding them to the collection of the available greeters, right? Then when someone comes along and they say, greet me in Swedish or greet me in English, the code will go and iterate through all these extensions, the iGreeters, and it will try to figure out which is the best one that provides a greeting for the culture that you're asking for. If we don't find one, then we're just going to tell you, sorry, I have no idea. So, But if we do, then we're going to send back what the ever greeter, the, the greeting the greeter <laughs> sends for us. The actual input, the interface for the greeter is very uh, basic, the simple it is. It has a method that we can query, can you handle this culture? And for the framework, that, uh, the implementation that says yes, we're going to actually tell it, give us the greeting. Again, we have this the assembly scanner that was shown before. 
And one of the um, important things that I think uh, that we should point out is that we will only look for public types. I mean, that's we think that's good conduct. We, we could actually forcefully create a, an instance of a private type, but if you made it private, you probably would don't want us to use it. So if we only look for public types. We also make sure it's not an abstract base class, uh, the, the assembly that we're scanning is not dynamics, because that's going to create a whole new world of problems for us. So we try to avoid uh, the number of cases where the code actually will blow up. Now, if you look at the impl in, um, of the default implementation here, we have a greeter that can greet us in Swedish. So when it's asked, can you handle this culture? It will check if the culture that it's being asked to handle is, is it Swedish? If so, it's going to return true. If not, it's going to return false. And when we eventually pull out the greeting, we're just going to return hi. Which, if you're not speaking Swedish, that means hello in Swedish. So if we run the code now, oh, see, I told you it wouldn't persist. So what it does says, the top line here says, hi, and the bottom line says, it's not able to provide a greeting for the call show ENUS, because we have no implementation of the iGreeter for ENUS. So if we drop back to our code again, and we actually provide an implementation that can, can provide a greeting in English. So this time, it will return true if you can if you can answer to ENUS, and it will return hello instead. We run the code again. This time, we can see us up front can see that it says hi and hello. So it basically took me if I hadn't cheated, this would have probably taken me less than a minute to create an implementation of, and I didn't need to tell the framework about it. It just worked next time I ran my code. And the added benefit here is also, what if I no longer need the English greeter? So, okay, I'll just remove it again. Oh, I kind of want this. So what happens here is, now it won't be available. But if we were following the traditional model of being explicitly have to tell the framework that this new functionality is available, then we'd either have to go back and remove the type from a collection or we'd get a compile error. Or if we were using a configuration file, we would have to go back to the configuration file and delete that line of code. Or we might end up risking getting a runtime error because it can't find the type in the, in the entire application domain. So again, it reduces the amount of ceremony that's needed to write code using our framework. If it's not there, you're not going to want to use it. If it's there, you're probably going to want to use it. Now, on top of this simple class here that's just the 10 or 12 lines of code, mm, here it is. We've actually implemented a bit more logic in Nancy. So, for instance, if you have multiple extensibility types, say we had something additional to the iGreeter that we wanted to automatically discover, it would not be a good idea to iterate through all the types and all the assemblies in the entire app domain once for each of these types, right? So by looking for each of the types that we're inspecting, if we could inspect it for all the known extensibility types, that means we just have to go through the app domain once. And that's when you start adding a lot of extensibility types, it's kind of a performance saver. The second thing here is you should really, if you're expecting to, to scan more than once during the application lifecycle, you probably should think about some sort of basic caching. So if you're trying to uh, get the same extensibility types more than once, you get it from the cache the second time. Because it's not very likely that your application domain has changed during the uh, life cycle of your application. But it's quite easy to build in as well to detect when assemblies have been loaded into application domain. And you can validate the cache, and you can rebuild it on the next query or up front. Again, just to boost performance. And the last thing is, we apply a convention in ANSI as well. So it's not uncommon for you to have 30 assemblies in your project if you're building something big. And we don't want to scan all the types. We want to reduce the set of assemblies that we scan. And the way that we do this with our help of our convention is, again, we only scan assemblies that has a reference to NANCY DLL. Because if you're not referencing our assembly, you're not going to contain an, an implementation of one of our extensibility types. So there's no point in iterating through all these assemblies. And even if you don't think you're going to have a lot of these assemblies loaded, the framework, the .NET framework, he'll make sure that you do have more than enough, right? So just by building a simple application, it, you're going to get a lot of baggage just from running your code. So these are three very basic and simple things that you could and most likely should add to your assembly scanning if you, you start implementing this.
So the last thing we are actually going to look at is bootstrapping. It's also the biggest concepts that we're going to talk about today. So when you're building a framework, you're building your API. This usually means that you have like a single class that a user creates an instance of, and through that class, they're going to get access to the API that you're designing. But your framework is probably going to consist of more than one class, right? So you have one class that contains the API, but the actual implementation of the framework could be a thousand classes. We don't know. And so what this traditionally does mean is that that root object or the API object is going to have to assume responsibility of creating uh, instance of whatever classes that it needs internally, and those classes are going to have to assume responsibility of creating instance of other framework class sets, and, and until we build the entire dependency tree. And this, and we all know that this is what we call hidden or hard dependency, right? And code with hidden or hard dependency is very hard to test. And we didn't want to write tests, uh, sorry, a framework that we couldn't have good test coverage with. We wanted to be able to write these loosely coupled types fully unit tested, but without sacrificing the capability of, or the, the way of using our framework of creating a simple uh, class instance and accessing all the functionality of that. So we need to figure out how can we take all these loosely tuple classes or types and stitch them back together at runtime. And that's where the bootstrapper steps in and helps. So in its simplest form, the bootstrapper is responsible for stitching all these types together. It goes out figures out what kind of class uh, implementations we have in our framework types, and it stitches them up in the right order, right? And the absolute simplest implementation we could provide would be to manually do the build the dependency graph for ourselves. So create an instance of A, create an instance of B, pass in the instance of B, uh, sorry, A to B, create an instance of C, take the B and C and pass that on to D, and build manually up this dependency tree that we would be creating with the hidden and hard dependencies anyway, but we're a bit lazy. I mean, th there's a lot of work. I, each time we go and change something, we have to go back and change, make sure we don't break the stitching again. We maybe change the signature of something or we add in a new type. We have to stitch it up in the right place. It's not very maintainable from our, from our point of view as well. So what we actually did is we based our implementation around uh, an IEC container. So when we start our, when we create the, at runtime, when we want to create the instance of that API, API class, what we actually do is, with the help of assembly scanning, is we go out and we find all these implementations of the Nancy types, all the interfaces and all the, the actual implementations, and we stick them into an IEC container. And then when we're, it's time to pull this, uh, the API object back out, we pull that instance out of the container. So that means that all the dependencies that all our types have will hopefully be satisfied, and we will get the configured and composed instance back out. So we have all these loosely typed, fully unit tested code, but at runtime we automatically stitch them up and the user doesn't have to know about this. They just get an instance of our framework back. Now when we were doing this, it also turns out that if we take the API of our bootstrapper and we tweak it just a little bit, then we can let you as the user reach into this process. So if there's something in that process that you don't like, an implementation of a type you don't like, for instance, say you don't like how a route pattern is defined in ANSI, or how the route resolution works, the algorithm that's uh, in place that decides which route is going to be executed depending on what values are sent in. You can actually create your own implementation of that interface, and you can tell the bootstrapper, when you need a route resolver, don't use the default one, but you're going to stick an instance of my type instead into the container. So then when we pull the object back out, my implementation is going to be part of that, comp uh, that composed object. So this actually means that your code is no longer just an extension, but it's part of the core of the framework. So our implementation is no longer even loaded into the application domain at runtime. It doesn't exist in memory. Your code does. So you can actually customize Nancy 100%. You can reach in and switch whatever implementation you want with your own functionality. And put I've often used a framework, and I've come to the point where it covers 95% of my use cases, or it works 95% the way I want it to. So if, if only I could get it to work for those other 5%, it would be awesome. Well, now you can, because if there's something I don't like, I create the implementation that worked the way I wanted to, and I replace the default one with my implementation, and I have the best framework ever, right? But 
what if your implementation of the route handler needs another dependency that's not a, a framework type? Remember I told you that the bootstrapper will look for framework types and we stick that into your container. But what if your route handler required an ifoo that sent something back th that you needed for runtime logic? If we just stuck your instance into the container, we try to pull it back out again, it will explode because it won't be able to satisfy that ifoo dependency. So go by going back again and just tweeting that, tweaking that API just a little bit more and enabling you to put arbitrary dependencies into the container during that process, you can create your own dependency tr trees. You can like branch off and create completely different new subsystems in Nancy that's based on your code, on your logic, and the way that you want to write code. And even though all these might sound very complicated, it's actually not. And I've prepared a very small demo. I never like the shit shortcut here. It's control Q. I mean, that's for me, that's quit. <laughs> Someone had a good day at Microsoft. All right, so what we have here is a very simple framework that validates objects against a set of business rules. And the actual framework is going to use something called an iValidator. And the iValidator itself, it just has a simple method. Pass the object in, get the result back. Now, the default validator, you can think of this as what we'd ship out of the box, takes a, a dependency on a set of rules. And when it's asked to validate the object, it's going to do so by querying all the rules and make sure that the rules say the object is OK. The validation rule itself is just a simple so a method, takes the object, returns a boolean. And again, the default implementation of that framework, uh, sorry, that rule, it just makes sure that the object is not null. So what we want here is when we create an instance of a framework, we want to get the configured instance of that validator back because we can now create independently unit test for the actual iValidator implementation and we can unit test the actual rules separately. So we need this stitching part. So we, we want to introduce the bootstrapper to this process. Now just ignoring for a second that there is a bootstrapper locator here. We're going to we're going to take a bootstrapper and we're going to tell it give me a validator back. So essentially what this means is pull a configured instance out of the container, right? And give it back. And we're going to stick it in, in a variable and we're going to make sure we only do it once for performance reasons because we don't want to do this composition multiple times. Then when the user goes and says validate, we know which kind of validator we want to use and we can execute it. But for our users, this could just have been, uh, you can create a new instance of whatever, but for simplicity, I just made it a static method. So if we look at the actual bootstrapper, in its simplest form, it's just an interface with a simple, with a single method on it. It says, give me a validator back. So for the simplest implementation, we could do that manual stitching that we were talking about. Create the instance of the validator, create an instance of each rule, pass it into that validator, and return that back. But again, we want to create an implementation based around an ISA container. So we create an abstract implementation of that interface. You know, it gets a bit more complicated, but it's not. So the implementation is based around a container. We don't yet know which container, right? And when we're got, when the first time that we're asked for a validator, or each time we actually ask for a validator, the bootstrapper is going to go back and check, have I been initialized? Uh, is this the first time, or has this call happened more than once? And if it's not been initialized before, it's going to play up. You can think of like a startup script. And the script basically says, give me an instance of whatever container you're going to use, register the validator in that container and register the validator that, that I'm returning. So this is going to be the default validator. Now, register all the rules as well in the container that you gave me. Then this method here is give the user an opportunity to register these arbitrary dependencies as well. And then just tell it, uh, then I'm going to consider myself initialized. The bootstrapper has two properties. It knows how to return the default implementation of the validator and, and the default rules, right? We could have used assembly scanning here as well, but wouldn't make for a good demo in this case. Now, the actual implementation of the, this base class is very simple. So we're creating a default implementation, and we're going to build it around TinyIOC, which is just a simple API, uh, sorry, uh, an IOC container. It's a simple CS file that you drop in your project, and you get a very small, super fast, and easy-to-use IOC container. 
Now, when the bootstrapper is playing up its startup script, it's going to say, give me an instance of the container, all right? I'm going to return you an instance of the container. Now, I'm going to need you, in that container, I'm going to need you to register this validator type. So I'm going to use, I'm going to call register on the container, and I'm going to register as an I validator. And likewise, register all these rules in the container. Then uh, when I'm, I'm asking you for a, a configure instead of the actual validator, pull it out of the container for me. Now, a uh, key thing to notice here is that we're passing along the container to the different methods because we know our bootstrapper is of type T, right? So because we're passing the actual container into the method, that means inside the methods, we get full access to the actual API of the container that we base our bootstrap around. So if we were to create an implementation around another uh, container like Autofact, the, the signature of these methods would not take a tiny ISE container, it would take an I lifetime scope instead. So we'd get the full API of that container instead. So if we not created some sort of common container abstraction, where we sacrifice functionality, we want to give you the, fu the capability of use the con container that you're most comfortable with and use the, the features of that container to its full capabilities. So if you actually set a breakpoint in this method here, let's hope. We can see that our, our uh, well, we not so well, but we can see that the instance that we got back was a default validator. And if we check on the actual validator, we can see that it does have its rule, which is just a non not null validator rule, right? And we can execute the code and it's gonna print the result out. The object uh, is valid, it's true. But now on the user, it comes along and says, okay, so the default implementation of the validator says that all the rules have to up be satisfied, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm happy with saying that 50% of all the rules just have to pass before and I consider this to be a valid object. This means I need to step in and I need to change the actual, actual implementation of the validator that the framework uses at runtime. So what I do is I create the implementation. We see that we have an arbitrary dependency on an ifoo. It should be here as well, of course, like so. IFU doesn't do anything right now. So now I have my implementation. Now I need a way to figure out how do I tell the actual the framework about this so it kn knows to, to do this. And the way that we do this is we inherit from the bootstrapper that has all the logic and we override the property that returns which validator we want to use. So instead of returning default validator, we turn custom validator. So when the, the startup script comes along and says register this validator, it's going to say register a a an instance of the custom validator instead. We're also going to take advantage of the fact that we can put whatever arbitrary dependencies we want into the container. So we register an instance of ifu as well. Now, the trick here is how does the framework know that it should be using our implementation, our bootstrapper, not just fall back and use the default one each and every time? And that's where the bootstrapper locator comes in. It's just another level of abstraction on, on figuring out what code we want to run. And if we check out the actual bootstrap loca locator, we can see it's it internally it uses the application domain scanner to, to look for all implementations of iBootstrapper. That is not the default one. So it's going to pick up the custom one if it's there. And if it's there, it's going to create an instance of that bootstrap and return it to us. Now, if there's no custom implementation of the bootstrapper, we're going to fall back and we're going to use the default implementation. So again, the user doesn't have to know about the bootstrapper, just they can just use the code. But when they need to customize the behavior of the framework, they create their implementation, and they adjust the implementation of the actual framework, the configuration of the framework, but they don't, once again, they don't explicitly have to go back and tell the framework, use this bootstrapper instead. We just figured it out for you. So if we run this code, I'm not going to provide an implementation. You can, you can think that ifoo perhaps just returned the thres threshold that 80% of our rules have to pass or 50%. If we run this code now, we'll see that we actually end up in the custom validator instead of the default one. And again, the default one will, will not even be loaded into memory at runtime. And our new validator is part of the framework. It's not extending the framework. It's changing the composition of the framework. 
and the bulk of the code was actually in the creating the, the base class. So if we if we have the need, so we keep adding more of these framework types. We just go in and we extend the abstraction here, and we uh, uh, we we update the initialization script to make sure that these new types are registered as, as well. And just by modifying the bootstrapper, the, uh, the stitching, the, the order of how things has to be stitched together is automatically solved for us. We don't have to pay any special attention to that. And this is something that, we, that users of Nancy are very appreciative about. And people use this uh, quite extensively in their implementation at their workplace because we need to support something different or uh, wire something different up. And Nancy enables us to do this because we can pop under the hood when we want to. If, if we don't need to, we'll never see this part of the, the framework at all. But like we have this extra layer for advanced usages that you can go and customize the framework. And that's all I had for you today. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> The code is also on GitHub now. Probably won't have the uh, assembly version <laughs> file, so I'll update the, the repository in them. Um, don't forget to vote as you on your way out, and if anyone has questions. No? So, lunch? Thank you for coming. <laughs>